welcome to uh, B B BWA Zoom Night. Um, tonight we are joined by uh, Mr. Eddie Brister of uh, Beaver's Bend Fly Shop. Eddie is a, uh, a former uh, college football coach and current fly fishing guru out of Beaver's Bend. And uh, he is um, going to be one of the folks running um, our trip with us in November, our Beaver's Bend fly fishing adventure. That uh, begins November 8th um, and runs through that weekend. Um, he's going to tell us a little bit about the area, uh, a little bit about the uh, fishing that uh, we can expect on this trip, um, and then uh, just a little bit about uh, fly fishing in general. So, uh, Eddie, good to have you. Uh, looking forward to uh, hearing what you've got to say about fly fishing in Beaver's Bend. Well, appreciate you inviting us on to do this and uh, giving us a chance to work with you in the, in, you know, on your, on your trips. You want me to just go ahead and get started, Robert, and kind of give a little synopsis about where we're going to be fishing and a little bit about the river and do that. And uh, I'd love to anybody that wants to jump in and ask questions later on I, to answer anything that uh, that you might have uh, at, at that particular point in time. Absolutely. So uh, just go ahead and um, tell us about the fishing. Uh, tell us about the area, uh, what we can expect that time of year and in, in early November. Um, what a guided trip looks like with you and your crew. Um, and uh, then we'll, we'll have time at the end for a couple of questions. Before I get uh, started with the, uh, with the area and, and where we'll be fishing, uh, let me just tell you a little bit about uh, our guide service. You ask about that. We have six guides that work for us full time. And uh, we provide both half day AM trips, half day PM trips, and we offer full day trips uh, in addition to all of that. And we stay pretty busy. We're, we're right now we're running about uh, over anywhere from 70 to 100 trips a month, uh, which is a little bit higher than normal. Uh, but this is just not a normal time for us to go through all the stuff that we're going through. But it's been pretty good to us. Uh, let me get started with this and talk a little bit about uh, where we're going to be fishing. First of all, we're going to be inside the state park. Beavers Bend State Park, and we're located mm, roughly 10 miles north of Broken Bow, Oklahoma, which is in uh, southeast Oklahoma. Uh, we're going to be fishing on the Lower Mountain Fork uh, River. Uh, the Lower Mountain Fork River is, or the Mountain Fork River itself, is not an extremely uh, long river. Uh, it originates somewhere up around Mena, Arkansas. And our watershed is uh, pretty much parallels uh, Highway 63 in uh, Oklahoma and Arkansas. And it comes on down 259 uh, until it hits Broken Bow Lake. Uh, and then right below that is where we will be fishing in the state park. Um, our river that we're, we have of fishable water is about 12 miles. Or that's what they listed as. Not all of that 12 miles is totally fishable, uh, but it is, uh, it's a pretty good length and, and we have very, very uh, uh, good water to fish for our trout. You'll fish for brown trout and you'll fish for uh, rainbows. They do stock the river every uh, two weeks of rainbows. They put rainbows in, but we're very fortunate that uh, we have a very productive, um, spawn spawning in here for both rainbows and browns today one of our guides had a trip and we caught several i'm not going to say native nothing is native here but wild <laughs> wild uh, browns that were there uh, and i say that because the, the browns that we have stocked in here uh, are anywhere from three inches and we're going to get ten thousand more pretty quick to put back into the river but uh, three years, two years ago, we stopped uh, 12,000 three inch uh, fingerlings a year before uh, or six months before that. So that was what, two and a half years ago, uh, we put in uh, 8,000 uh, six inch browns. And then right after that, we put in, I think, 4,000 12 to 14 inch browns. 
So those browns have gotten pretty big. Plus we had a good supply of brown trout in here to start with. Uh, you know, we had two floods in uh, 2015 and that, that hurt us a little bit. That knocked us back a little bit, but we have recovered a great, uh, greatly from that, those two floods. What it hurt the river is when you guys get up here or when you fish the lower mountain fork, you're literally going to fish the newest river in the United States because it totally transformed it, totally changed it from what we had had before. It took a lot of canopy out, but it made the stream identical to what you would see if you were going to fish a uh, Colorado mountain stream. To give you an example of how good the fishery is, the United States Youth uh, Junior uh, fly fishing team, the world fly fishing team comes up here to practice. And of course, you know, they're hugely into uh, Euro nymphing, but this water is very, very conducive to that. And th those guys can go anywhere in the United States they want to go. And they choose to come here at least once a year uh, to practice uh, before they go off on their competitions in the summertime. So it's a very, very um, unique river. It's unique from the standpoint that, it, of course, it's a tailwater river, but the first five miles of the river, we can fish every single day, uh, 24 hours a day, even if they're generating, because they don't generate until we get five miles down the river. Uh, when they built the lake, they made it this way. I think ODWC had a hand in doing it. And as far as I know, if there's any other river like this, I don't know where it is. Uh, you, you guys, if you know it, let me know because I've said that before and I most certainly don't want to be a liar, although all fishermen are liars, but that's, a, that's another point, I guess. But uh, it is a very unique uh, river to fish. We, we get a constant 180 CFS out the spillway all the time. Now, once you get past five miles where the generators are, and if they do generate, that water is kicked up to about 8,000 CFS. So you have to get off of the river like you do all of the tailwaters rivers when they're generated, you know, down, down in zone two. But <clears throat> when you get up here, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about and, and how we do that. Um, the first part of the river I'm going to talk about, I'm gonna talk about the upper part of the river more than anything else, where we do a lot of our fishing, a lot of our guiding, we kind of break it up into about six sections. <clears throat> the first mile of the, uh, we call Spillway Creek. And that's because it comes out of Spillway. That's where the impetus of all of the, uh, uh, the water flow comes from. Not the, not the uh, powerhouse, but from Spillway, the Spillway gates. And again, right now in the winter time, uh, we'll, we'll drop our flow to about 120 CFS. Uh, we don't need all of that water to be cool. Uh, we bring it out of the lake at about 50, 45 to 50 feet deep. So we get a pretty good, uh, a, a pretty good source of cool water, even in the summertime. Uh, the first mile of the river uh, it, uh, is, is going to fall in elevation about 65 feet. And over, uh, that's over a mile that it, it, it drops that much. So we get a pretty good, uh, you know, a pretty good flow of water coming, coming out of the spillway. Uh, you're gonna find out in Spillway Creek, it's gonna be fast water. Uh, we're gonna have uh, pocket water. We're gonna have some falls. We have one falls that's about 10 foot tall. Thus, we call it the 10 foot falls. But the, uh, it, you know, in places like that, you're gonna have good uh, plunge pools to fish in. That water there is about eight to 10 foot deep. The majority of the water coming out of spillway is gonna be anywhere from, oh, a foot to two foot deep. Now you're gonna get into some, uh, some runs that may be three or four foot deep. Uh, you're gonna have fast runs. You're gonna have uh, flats that as you go through this. Uh, you're going to have a lot of uh, a lot of pocket water like you would in a in a you know in any mountain stream that you have. Um, that part of the river we fish a lot in the summertime. Really hit it hard in the summertime. It is not uh, pressured as much in the in the summer by everybody going up and down the river and things like that. Although 
the last year or so, we've had a tremendous influx of, of visitors to the, uh, to the river, but our guides will utilize that area more. We get cooler water, it's closer to the, to the lake, and it, and it falls uh, enough that it keeps a, uh, a good temperature even in the summertime. In the summer, you're gonna get temperatures anywhere from 63 to 65 right there. Uh, when you guys were up here, it wouldn't surprise me to have uh, 30, uh, 50, 53, 52 to, to maybe 62 degree water uh, that when we're here, and which is very, very, very good for us. Well, that's, that's the first mile of the, uh, of the river. The next area uh, we're gonna call the bluffs. So we call it the bluffs. And it, it because it makes a sharp uh, 90 degree turn and it goes up against a bluff wall. And that's, a, it's probably a hundred feet up. Uh, that is a very productive area for big fish uh, the, uh, where the bluff makes the hard turn. Uh, it gets pretty narrow and it does speed up quite a bit. And then it will flow out into a much wider, uh, slower area. The, the whole bluff area is gonna be, I, I don't know, we, we don't weight it. I mean, it's probably five to seven foot deep. And uh, it's just a different type of fishing there. Uh, from the bluffs, it narrows down quite a bit and we go into what we call the structure water. Uh, the structure water is given that name by our guides because when they were doing some removing of rocks after the flood, uh, our guides got those guys to put big boulders into the stream. The stream is going to be maybe 15 yards, 45 feet, 50 feet wide, uh, maybe a little wider in some places, but we have put huge boulders in there. We put a lot of structure in there. That particular run of water is going to be probably a a quarter of a mile, and it probably falls another eight to 12 feet right there. So we get another type of water into that. Then it's gonna flow into what uh, we call the, uh, the flats. From the flats, it goes into the evening hole. If you know anything about our river, you've probably heard the evening hole, that term uh, given, and that is probably one of the uh, most fished, uh, heavily fished areas. It's a great place for spawning. Uh, it is a, uh, it's gonna be a little bit slower. It widens up a little bit uh, before it go, goes under a, a bridge uh, that, that makes a big bend uh, in, into the river. That is a very fishable spot and I'm sure we will hit that at least one time in our, you know, during our trip, maybe, uh, maybe more than that. From that point, it's gonna go three or four miles that is, I would say two miles, that we don't fish it gr a great deal. It's just not what we want to fish. And then it goes into what we call the powerhouse run. Uh, we call it that because it is right before the powerhouse and it's the last bit of what we call free water that we can fish all the time. And it, it's a little bit different. It's going to be a little bit faster than some of the water. Uh, it's going to be real uh, spiny. When I say that, it's going to be some big rocks in there. You have to be on your P's and Q's when you're down there as far as walking it and, uh, you know, just getting around uh, that particular area. But it is very good, uh, very good fishing uh, the majority of the time uh, when there. Now, when they generate, you don't have to get out, even though you're only 400 yards from where the water comes in to generate, uh, but it just doesn't fish very well. We don't hit it and fish it very much when, they, or when they're generating right there. Then you go another mile down the river and we get to what we call zone two. It's below an old park dam and it turns into big water. And I'm talking about wide, uh, you know, it looks like a big river. And you have to kind of know where you're going there uh, to be productive. And when they generate down there, you've got to get off of that water. You've got to get out because it's going to run anywhere from four to 8,000 CFS coming down. And we don't, don't want to be around when they're doing that part of it. Um, that's kind of a quick note on what the, the river uh, looks like. Uh, if you want me to go on, Robert, I will. Uh, and I'll talk about what we want to fish when we get up there, or we can stop and, and if they want to ask, ask questions right now while this is fresh on their mind, we can do that. Uh, it, whatever you want to do, it doesn't make me any difference. Well, 
tell us a little bit about, you know, it, the kind of fishing that we're going to be doing, you know, um, for the un uninitiated, um, is this a float trip? Is this a wading trip? Uh, are we going to be fishing dries? Are we going to fish be fishing dropper rigs? Uh, we, we, we do float it occasionally, but we only float that area that I said we don't wade in because it's not very good for wading. We do float it. One of our guides has a, uh, a, a float boat <clears throat> that we will do it occasionally, but our, most of our trips, 99% of our trips are wade, uh, wade fishing uh, into this area. And in answer to what we're going to fish, that's kind of what I was going to talk about next. And I'll just go right into that uh, when, we, when we get into that. Right now, to give you an example, there's not a great hatch coming off. We're getting a few blue, blue wings. We're getting a few um, little sulfurs, some things like that. But the big, if we want to fish dries, we go to grasshoppers at this time of year our ants. So we've had enough rain and things of that nature that we'll throw uh, some, uh, you know, some ant patterns as well. But right now we're catching a lot of fish on a hopper dropper, a big chubby, uh, either pink, uh, olive, or black and tan. And we always throw a dropper. We throw droppers under everything, whether it's dries or, you know, if we're running a nymph, nymph rig. But when you, you fellas are up here, We'll be at the very, very end of the uh, hopper, you know, the hopper patterns that we will throw. We'll, we'll still be able to, to throw some hoppers, but we'll be throwing blue wings and we'll be throwing uh, uh, caddis. We get a tremendous caddis hatch up here and our caddis will throw in uh, both black and tan and some olive, but most of them tan and, and black. Uh, We'll throw them in a in a uh, the range of you know size sixteen to twenty you know something like that uh, a lot of eighteens and twenties more so than anything uh, as far as the uh, blue wings we'll throw blue wings in anywhere from uh, you know fourteens to twenties in our blue wings as well uh, for that now we'll also during that time of year we'll throw some. Uh, well, it's, it's not uncommon for us to throw a few stones, like a, a yellow sally, a sexy sally. Uh, we'll throw, uh, several times we'll throw um, uh, different stimulators and, and do that. Uh, and, and we're almost getting back into the hopper pattern when we throw those big stimulators with legs. But that is a good time to throw those uh, as well. And again, we'll usually put a barge emerger, a WD-40, uh, a zebra midge, uh, something of that, that nature underneath as a dropper, uh, RS2. RS2 has been a tremendous pattern for us in both black, uh, olive, and gray. Uh, all year long, we'll, we'll try and throw those. But we, we, we try and hit those patterns during November. But right now, we're staying away from dries and throwing uh, mainly grasshoppers if, when we, you know, if we want to use uh, a, a dry fly. And, and, and do that. As far as our nymphs are concerned, <clears throat> those guides will sometimes, if they want to use three, three, uh, three droppers, they'll, they'll go pretty small. And they'll start with something like a, a Frenchie, uh, a hothead Frenchie. They'll start, they'll use uh, barge emergers and uh, again, um, RS2s or anything in that range and nothing bigger than an 18, probably try and get, not go much smaller than a, uh, a 20. There are times that we have to go to a 22. It, it's almost like, and I, I, I know you guys have, have heard and maybe fish uh, the San Juan, how small you have to go on that. We have to do the same thing here at certain times. The line, uh, your leader, uh, I, would, I would bring five and six, uh, you know, leaders in five and sixes, uh, your tippet, uh, again, in uh, five and six, we hardly use a seven, you know, seven X tippet in our guide service. And it's because we have so many people that are just not familiar with, with fly fishing. And it, uh, you may get hit more, but I promise you they couldn't catch some of the fish. They couldn't handle some of the fish that they might catch. And if you have a six X, you can do that. 
Uh, but if you're comfortable with the 7X, by me, all means, uh, take that. But our guides carry more 5 and 6 than they do anything. We do not do a lot of streamer fishing. That's not to say they don't or they won't. We get people uh, up here all the time and say, we want to learn more about streamer fishing. And if that's the case, we'll throw, you know, they'll take them out and, and fish streamers. As a matter of fact, there was a young man that, that came up from, uh, let's say he was from Houston, I believe. And when he called, he set the trip up and they, he said, the only thing I want to fish is streamers. And we said, well, the productivity is going to go down. And he goes, I don't care. I just want to be with the guide for a full day and I want to fish streamers. And he did, and he caught fish. And that's what he wanted out of that trip. Uh, but we just don't throw a lot of streamers, although we have water that's very productive or be conducive to streamer, streamer fishing. Uh, other, other types of uh, nymph rigs that we would throw uh, would be, uh, you know, you, you might get a patch rubber leg, stimulate some stone flies. Uh, we would use those in black, brown, and uh, tan, uh, brown and black sometimes together. And again, we would always drop something under that. If you remember me talking about zone two being a big water, when we go down there, it's not uncommon for those guides to put two big uh, patch rubber legs on and, and follow one with the uh, bigger fly. And uh, we, we get, we seem to get a different type of fish down there. And when I say that, I'm talking about they'll steal your lunch money if you're not careful. I mean, they'll, they'll give you a good run for the money. Uh, it's a little bit different water down there. And uh, those fish act a little bit differently in what they'll hit and what they do after they, they get on the line. But uh, that the stonefly pattern is something we use as the top fly. We'll use a prince nymph as the top fly. Uh, again, in oh, a, a 14 to a 20, uh, I wouldn't go much bigger than a 14. Uh, we'll sometimes put uh, tungsten uh, on, on the print snips. We like to use tungsten on most all of our, our top flies because we can get away with putting a, uh, a split shot on above and, and because sometimes it gets pretty stealthy with, uh, with the fishing. So we, we try and use tungsten as much as we can on our top fly. Uh, we we'll use pheasant tails. Uh, pheasant tails, if we're using as a top fly, We'll make it a bead head uh, uh, flashback, and the bead again. We try and put make it a tungsten uh, on that. Uh, we'll use a tongue teaser. If you guys have fished in Colorado very much, and some of those rivers up there, a tongue teaser is a pattern that you're probably familiar with. It's kind of a cross between the pheasant tail and a prince nymph, but it is a great fly to uh, uh, to use as an attractor fly, and it gets down really quick. A lot of the uh, Euro nymphers use a tongue teaser. Uh, we'll use even a more traditional pattern, I guess, along the lines of a, a pheasant tail would be a gold ribbed hare's ear. And I, I truly believe that's a, an underused fly uh, down here on this part, probably anywhere. We, uh, not a lot of people fish it, but it is productive uh, when you, you use it down here. I've already mentioned what type of droppers we would use, zebra midges, bars emergers, uh, WD-40s and uh, RS-2s, and, and you could use other things too. Soft hackle would be good. Prismatic emergers uh, would be good. Uh, we'll take a pheasant tail, the size 20 pheasant tail, in a natural pattern, uh, no bead, no, uh, no flash, and, and run it. Uh, you, you get into the same thing as you would with the soft hackle if you do that. We will also use a black Copper John in the size 20 uh, as a dropper. Right now, uh, our guides have found out that <clears throat> Copper John, Copper, Copper Johns, and it probably has something to do with, uh, uh, it's not probably, it does, with the, the, uh, the murkiness of the water that we're catching a lot of fish on a Copper, Copper John. And they don't use a Copper, Copper John very much in the course of the year, but they have found it to be real productive right now during, during this time period. Uh, rod sizes, if you guys are going to talk about that, it, we don't need a size, we don't need a six weight rod. Uh, a, a three, four, or five is what I would recommend. A four and five is probably uh, the most widely used rod up here. Eight foot to nine foot, all of our uh, shop rods 
are nine foot five weights. We have a few nine foot four weights, but that's kind of where we go there. Uh, there's not a need for a sinking line up here. Uh, the lines that we would recommend would all be weight forward uh, floating. Uh, and and I, you just don't have to get down deep. And I've already said we don't use much streamers and, and there, therefore, it, you know, we, we don't really get into that. Uh, we would recommend that if you use a, uh, an indicator and in, in most of our guide service trips, we do use indicators. Uh, we're kind of partial to the, to the airlocks, although they're hard to get right now. Uh, I'm not trying to be an advocate of that or advertising for them, but they just work, work better for us uh, with, with what we do. Uh, your boots, I would suggest that you wear felt. Uh, we, we wear felt and uh, studded. Uh, most of our guides wear a, a studded or felt, uh, felt and studded together. Uh, and, and we find out that that's pretty good because we do have a pretty good area that's got some slate rock on it. And it's gonna be, un, it's, it's not level, it's gonna be kind of stair-stepped. And we have found out that the, the studs help us quite a bit right there. Although sometimes little princess floaties are the only thing that's gonna help you up there in that area because you, you, may, you may be in the water pretty quick. Uh, but we, we do use felt uh, with that. If you wanna wear hip, uh, not hip wetters, if you wanna wear just wading pants, you can get to most areas in wading pants. Uh, in November, you're probably okay weather-wise if you wear a coat and over wading pants. Uh, I would suggest that you wear chest high waders just to be on the, on the safe side uh, with that. At the time that uh, November, early November is gonna be here, I would recommend that you wear felt socks, that you wear something that you can uh, layer and take it off should you want to, should you want to do that. Um, that's, that's kind of a quick synopsis, but I, I think I've spent about 15 minutes of, uh, about 20 minutes of 15 that you gave me. So I don't know how much more you want me to uh, talk about this, Robert. I, and I'll, I'll be glad to do anything you want to do, uh, discuss things in more clarity and more, uh, you know, uh, more defined time periods and just let me know. This has been great. Uh, you, you've gone into a lot of good detail. Um, what would you say, obviously, you know, a fishing guide can't make any guarantees, but what would you say is, is a good, um, a good to great day um, on the lower mountain fork in terms of quantity and size of fish? And, and right now, it's going to be different than what it should. And I'm not trying to put more pressure on these guides that are going to take you out, but they will tell you the same thing I am. In the summertime, when it's hot, and those fish are like you and I, they want to sit in that air conditioner or they want to sit in that faster uh, water and not be as active as they are right now. Uh, if we catch six or seven fish in a, in a half a day uh, and miss eight or nine more, 10 more, then that, that, that may be a pretty good day. Although we've had some 20, you know, 20 plus fish, I'm talking about per person, not in a group uh, days. Uh, you know, during the summertime. It's not uncommon for us to catch in the neighborhood of, you know, 15 to 20 fish in a half a day, uh, in a full day. It, it's not always doubled in a full day, even though it's twice as long because sometimes summer, uh, not in the summer, but sometimes we have a little bit of a slack period uh, in the afternoon and uh, it gets better as we get closer to the, to the end of the trip. Uh, so in, in that case, it wouldn't be far-fetched to catch 22 fish. Uh, we're going to catch them in the range of, uh, this sounds funny, but I hope we catch some in the size of three to four inches at somewhere in there, because that tells me that you're catching those wild fish. And that's a, that's a great thing for our stream when we do that. We caught uh, two little browns yesterday that were about six inches. And they haven't been put in here. I mean, uh, those fish had to have been spawned in here because we haven't put that size fish in that would match up to where they are right now. On the upper side of it, uh, we're catching uh, some browns now in the, in the range of 18 to 22, uh, which is, you know, pretty good. They, they give you a pretty good battle. 
rainbows, uh, we will catch a 24 or 25. And so I, I go back to this. I said, bring a three weight if you're comfortable with that. If you do, you better have your track shoes on and get ready to go downstream because those guys will be hollering like crap at you to come on, let's go. And, uh, you know, get down with, with, with fish like that. But the normal fish that we will catch are going to be uh, in the range of uh, probably 12, 14 on the lower side, 16 to 18 on the, on the upper side with a real good chance of catching a bigger fish. We, we uh, landed a 25, uh, 25 inch rainbow two, three months ago during the time period of which we should not have caught that fish. And, and we caught it in an area where it really surprised me that we did, but they're in here. They, they will be in here. Uh, and unfortunately at, at the early part of November, uh, we're uh, right before Thanksgiving. Let me just say this right before Thanksgiving, we, <coughs> we take some stop logs out and that allows some of those big fish to run from the lower part of the river all the way back up and they start chasing that colder water and they'll go all the way up to spillway, spillway Creek. We don't take those stop logs out until about two to three weeks after we'll have our trip with you. Uh, and, and that's a good time to come, uh, you know, uh, because the, the river is totally open then. There is nothing that's gonna block those fish from going all the way up and down the river at that time. They put those stop logs in to back water up for the uh, summer for the canoes and kayak companies that do that. And that's the reason they put those in there. Uh, but and they will still be in probably uh, when, when we're here at that time, but it's not unusual to catch a, a, you know, 24, 25 inch fish, you know, in, in that range. And down in zone two, there, there's a trade off for zone two. You're going to catch bigger fish and uh, in zone two, uh, harder fighting fish in zone two, just because of the nature of that, of the way the river is and where those fish live year round. They, they're a little bit tougher fish down there. And uh, the trade-off down there is you may not, instead of catching 20, you may only catch 10, but they all may be 16 to 20. You know, so that's kind of a, a deal that you get into that when you, you know, when you get down there. So that's kind of where we're talking about, you know, in, in that range. And I was probably conservative for a reason, but that you, you can shoot for that. Man, tw 25 inch rainbow, I'm, I'm sold. I'm there. Uh, uh, yeah, that's uh, <laughs> it was a it was a beautiful fish. Uh, it you can see it in the shop. I, we've got a picture of of uh, the guy that did it. As a matter of fact, uh, we've had the Patriot Anglers up here this week. Again, I talked about that. Well, Lou is in charge of that program, and he caught that fish the day before all of the vets came up here. The veterans came up here. He's in charge of the program, and he always goes out with one of our guides before the trip. And he caught that fish there. So he had a little bit of bragging rights for the rest of the, for the rest of the time that they were up here. So just to wrap this up uh, again, thank you, Eddie, so much for uh, spending time with us tonight and sharing some of your, uh, your knowledge um, and giving us an idea of what this trip's going to look like. Again, Backwoods Adventures is going to the Lower Mountain Fork River um, in Beaver's Bend, um, November 5th through 8th. I uh, misspoke earlier. Uh, trip starts November 5th, ends November 8th. Uh, we're staying in a, um, a really, really nice cabin uh, that's there in uh, Broken Bow, just outside Broken Bow. And then we'll be fishing with um, Eddie's team uh, for two full days. Um, and then on the third day, we'll, fit, we'll do a self-guided uh, half day uh, before departure. So if you want more information about this trip, uh, go to backwoods.com slash adventures um, and then uh, everything will be there for you. You can put down a deposit. You can give us a call and ask questions. Um, just go to backwoods.com slash adventures. Again, Eddie, thank you so much. I uh, appreciate your time. Jim, Tim, Steve, thank you for joining us. And um, Eddie, thank you much, Bob. No, well, we appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks, we'll Kevin. Eddie. Thank you.